All right, before I get going, uh, who here has heard of SaltStack before? Okay, most. Who here have deployed Salt before? So no one in here is managing a production deployment of Salt? I know, I know you're involved in one. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, the primary point of this presentation is to go over how a lot of these large um, web scale companies are using SALT and talk specifically about a number of the points um, that are in there and tie it into a number of other technologies that are out there and talk about how they come together to create complete infrastructures. Now, the problem here that we face is that this is being cut off on the left. Um, one of the problems here that we face in modern infrastructures is the fact that we've been blasting around these AAS phrases like MAD over the last few years. And the problem is, is that we need to move well beyond what they offer. What we need to do is start talking about or talk about more what goes on top of those platforms, not just how to build them. And so a lot of what I'm going to be going over today has to do with a number of different infrastructures, how they work, and, um, well, how they're built. Because what it boils down to is that there's a lot of infrastructures out there that are built on infrastructure as a service clouds or platform as a service clouds, but there are a number of hardware infrastructures which are very... Um, web scale or whatever you want to call it. Now, I'm going to go over just a few examples um, in here that have to do with a couple of cloud-like companies. And so the first one is going to do with how Wikimedia uses uh, SALT and a number of other tools for continuous deployment of code and the continuous deployment of Wikipedia itself. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the techniques used by LinkedIn. They are a bare metal shop, uh, but they have just shy of 30,000 servers right now. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about something that's a little more next generation. Um, SaltStack, the, uh, the company behind Salt, we recently got a contract uh, working on some really interesting uh, virtual machine auto scaling applications. And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing with regard to that and also some of the new stuff that we are in the process of developing and delivering and, of course, making open source. So if we start up here, I'm going to start by talking about the problem of continuous code delivery. Now. There are a lot of ways to tackle the problem of continuous code delivery, as I imagine many of you are well aware. But fundamentally, there's a number of core things that need to be considered. Now, among those is that that continuous code delivery mechanism needs to be directly tied into some sort of continuous integration system or directly tied into revision control systems so that it can be delivered continuously. Um, the next is distribution of code out to different locations so that you can have different types of file distribution and fan out mechanisms. Service interruption is very important, obviously, because what you end up looking at is that for extremely large websites and very professional deployments, they like to go through great lengths to make sure that you never hit the website during one of these code deployments, because they can be very frequent. You can have many code deployments in a day. You don't want users to hit that website in the middle of a deployment and something wrong to happen because files were in an intermittent state. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, the idea of taking your tools or your mindsets or your methodologies and turning them into a culture inside of an organization which is where a lot of these concepts of DevOps, for instance, really come into their own because it has to do more with communication inside of uh, an organization. So I really like the Wikimedia solution for continuous code deployment. The person who put this together, uh, Ryan Lane, very intelligent fellow. So I'm going to do a quick overview here and then come back and readdress some of these issues. 
So we start out by the fact that Wikimedia is using Jenkins for testing of their code bases. And so they've got tests and builds being executed on Jenkins, which is probably something extremely common in this room. Who here is using Jenkins? Okay, okay, that's 62%. <laughs> now, what they do is if we look at a salt topology, salt is made so that you have a master, or as we were discussing earlier, you can have multiple masters, and then those masters are controlling minions. Now, all of those minions are able to either communicate back up to that master or receive information down from it. Now, and by information, I mean they can receive instructions or they can download code or get all, everything that they need for, say, uh, configuration management routines that are highly complex. Now, in the, in the Wikimedia situation, what they're doing is that they have Saltmaster and minions, and out on one of their minions sits the Jenkins server, okay? Every time that Jenkins server executes or finishes a build, which has been tagged in such a way to invoke a code deployment, they use Salt's peer system. Now this is the ability for minions to go send a message up to the master and then request that somebody else in the infrastructure execute on said message and then return the information back to that minion. So the peer system allows them to have a plug into Jenkins that fires off a command to the salt master to say, hey, let the web tier know that we have fresh code for them. That information then subsequently goes down to the web tier, tells them, hey, update your code. They check into Jenkins. This is, of course, within a second of that build completing. Download that information and deploy it, deploy the code. Fairly simple and straightforward. Now, the next cool thing here is that they want that information about that code deployment to be living somewhere outside of this simple command structure, okay? They want it inside of a Redis database that's being used by their internal web front end that tracks everything that's going on at Wikimedia on the insides. And so Salt has a solution for that called returners. All of these commands that we talk about in Salt where we have a central unit that splays out lots of instructions down to its minions happens asynchronously. Now the benefit here is that we don't really care about necessarily that message coming directly back up to the source. We can redirect the return information to any arbitrary uh, location. Now most more commonly that ends up being a database. So in this case Wikimedia uses returners inside of the salt minion to say once you're done deploying this code go load the information about this code deployment up into a Redis database. And then that is instantly available to their internal, uh, their internal web interface. So at that point, they're able to see that deployment process from start to finish and have all of that information presented for them. And nobody has to touch the infrastructure to make it happen. It is completely and fully automated. All they have to do is set some tag in Git that Jenkins is watching for. Sorry, SVN. Um, okay. Now, if we move a little forward here, Wikimedia was the first really big scale company to deploy this sort of setup. Since then, we've seen it done a number of different ways, and we've worked with companies to do it a number of different ways. And since then, a substantial amount of additions have been placed into SALT. So, again, we start from that original source of a build server. Just got build bot and bamboo with some other options up there. I'm trying to think of some other options. Those are the ones I've used the most heavily personally. But so as soon as those builds complete, instead of using this peer system I was talking about, since Wikimedia set up their deployment, we've added something called the event bus inside of Salt. 
Now this idea is that everything in salt is events. It's all entirely event driven. And so whenever any action completes, events get fired in specific locations. So when Jenkins finishes a build, it fires an event on salt and tells on the minion and says, hey, tell the master that, the, that this build event has completed. This is very simple to do because salt's event system is open-ended. Any external application that has sufficient privileges on that machine, so generally root access on the machine, but privileges can of course be granted in other ways, is able to fire its own events on SALT's bus. So that event then goes back up to the SALT master where we have the reactor. Now the reactor is something that uh, we're going to talk about in more depth a little later, but basically the reactor is listening to these events as they fly by, and it's able to subsequently make a decision and say, given set event, I'm going to automatically execute a, a specific routine. And so we are able to configure the reactor to just say, if I'm given a deploy event, I'm going to fire off a deployment to the systems to which that deploy event has requested a deploy event. Okay? Now similarly, there is this problem of how we're going to be distributing files. Now when you get into really big infrastructures, this becomes a problem. In smaller infrastructures, say sub a thousand servers, uh, it really isn't that big of a deal. It can be if the files are quite large, of course. Uh, but not as, not as regularly as when you're dealing with, say, Twitter-sized infrastructures. And so when it comes to code deployment and update, SALT has been built with an asynchronous queuing file server. Now the idea behind this is that by using AMQP techniques, we've been able to build a system that queues multiple connections back to SALT's own file server so that it is optimized for the distribution of files across massive numbers of systems in parallel. Now with that, we see many infrastructures having many, many thousands of servers requesting files from the SALT file server simultaneously. And it's able to keep up with that and subsequently deliver those files. Also, SALT has the ability to hook directly into package management systems. So if your Jenkins system is uh, building uh, distribution packages, if that's the route that you've taken, um, then that works. Same with plugging into systems like PIP or CPAN or uh, GEMS or what's the one for uh, PECL? That's a uh, PHP one, yeah. But so we've got a number of systems that allow for pulling down and managing connections and code deployments when they're packaged, as well as getting them directly out of version control software. Now, the last thing is the question of where the results go for that continuous code deployment. Now, you've got a number of options in this. One is that we recently released open source, of course, the Haylight uh, web interface, which is uh, the UI for SALT. It's a little new, it's a little raw, still needs some features, I'll admit. Um, but it is coming up quite quickly. And so the information from those code deployments can be displayed in Haylight. Or you can do it the Wikimedia way, send it to a database and have some other system view it. Now this returner concept I was talking about earlier, the idea that the salt minion can go in and attach to any external database or interface allows you to easily configure messages to say that when this message is done, send an email to somebody. Or when this, uh, sorry, when this routine is done, populate a database, let's see, send an email, send an SMS, post information about the successful build on a specific chat server, all of these hooks are already in there, making it again really easy to just say, redirect that data to wherever, okay? All right, any questions, comments? Yes. Um, so in the sequence of events going from Jenkins um, causing a, a reaction there, 
Uh -huh. What happens if any component in that chain happens to be down or unavailable? Are these messages delivered reliably or not? Okay. Uh, the question is if uh, if anything is down in that chain, are these questions delivered reliably? Now. Um, inside of salt, if a master is down, then the minion who is sh shooting an event up to it holds that event in a queue and waits for the master to reconnect. When the master comes back online, then it fires. Okay? Um, if the master is sending out a publication or a command down to minions and minions aren't online, those get discarded. Primarily because you don't want a minion that's been on, offline for two weeks to boot back up and then replay a bunch of old messages. Does that answer your question? So just to clarify, the, if the reaction is to uh, deploy something, uh -huh. and the thing you're trying to deploy to is down at the time that the reaction occurs, yes. then when the thing comes back online, it won't get deployed without some extra, extra work to bring things back into sync. Correct. Um, with that said, we do have a number of routines that you can, that, that can be easily configured on those minions to tell them to come back up to speed when they boot up. Okay. All right. So one of the next problems that I want to talk about is uh, the classic case of extremely large infrastructures. So extremely large infrastructures is something that we're seeing more and more pop up and a lot of uh, salt users, even salt users who are using us on very small scale um, really like the fact that we have these sorts of deployments that we work with on a regular basis. So they know that if they need to scale and many of them hope they'll need to scale in the future, I mean especially if you're a startup you always want to need to scale in the future, <laughs> then they're assured that the deployment and system that they're working on is something that can grow with their company and with their deployments. And so when we have to start looking at communicating with many tens of thousands of servers and managing tens of thousands of servers, some new problems prop up. And so one of my favorites uh, from LinkedIn is about, what was it, maybe a year and a half ago, there was the Java leap second bug if you recall, was it a leap second? Well, it was a timing bug in Java. They were sitting there and they had a meeting discussing, okay, what are we going to have to do to deal with this? We're going to have to log into these servers. We're going to have to verify that they're up to date. Are we going to build shell scripts that are going to do it automatically? Do we have SSH systems that can handle this? Um, and they were only a few minutes through the meeting when a guy in the back raised his hand and said, we're done. I ran a couple of salt commands, we're done. We fixed everything in a few seconds. And so salt itself is made to start having these tools that become very apparent once you get into larger deployments. Now I've got on my laptop here, I am simulating, let's see if, uh, here we go. I am simulating a somewhat, not, it's not a very large deployment because it's just a laptop. <laughs> but what it looks like with Salt to have 25 servers attached. And so when we run through, let me adjust this, I don't want to get it cut off. All right. So when we run through and look at what some of the basic functionality of SALT is, it really rotates around this element of remote execution and the idea of sending out perfectly parallel commands across large volumes of systems. And so if we wanted to, say, get the network information of all of our systems, we're able to get that information in just a few seconds. Another nice thing is that salt still keeps going quite quickly as it scales. So one of, one of my favorite quotes was from Harvard University um, when they deployed salt on a 1800 node uh, high performance computer. And they said that the old method that they used, which used the parallel SSH tool, 
to fan out and execute commands on their entire supercompute cluster and then return that information back took them roughly 15 minutes to run. Okay? And then they installed salt and now it takes them less than five seconds. So it becomes very useful. It really opens up a whole new world of what you can do because all of a sudden you have real-time stat gathering. Um, you've got real-time modification. You can go out and say, oh, well, we've got a disgruntled employee and we need to get rid of his password right now. And you can get rid of his SSH keys everywhere. Or similarly, you can say, we've got a security hole that we need to fix in our entire infrastructure right now. And you can run that routine that's going to update those packages everywhere at the same time. Similarly, it's very easy to allow it to stagger those updates. So you can say, okay, update 5% at, at, at a time and roll through the entire infrastructure's deployment. So when we come back and we start talking about larger infrastructures, this is something that becomes, uh, well, very important. Okay. So LinkedIn started using SALT and frighteningly early. They were using it in 2011 um, before I had deployed it in a real environment. It almost makes me regret start, you know, that whole first commit being open thing. People were using it. <laughs> um, but they recently came back and rewrote all of their SALT deployments uh, to take advantage of a lot of the new features. But some of the main things uh, that I was talking about is really central to how they manage their infrastructure today. A lot of what they do has to, a lot of what they do today has to do with the ability to gather real-time statistics about what's going on. It's their ability to go out and see exactly what version of software exists on all of their systems and then find those systems that have differences and get the, that information reported back in a few seconds and subsequently go out and make modifications so that it's very easy to run a couple of salt commands and then ensure that every bit of code across their infrastructure of just shy of 30,000 pieces of bare metal is consistent, okay? Next, we talk about uh, triggering code deployments. Now, they don't have a continuous code deployment that works quite the same way as the ones which um, I've already shown, but they do illustrate a point that's inside of SALT that's really cool. So they have code deployment processes that are very, very tightly tuned so that they're rolling through servers in a very clean way. Now, what they do is that they want to make sure that the load balancer has taken a web server out of the mix before they start modifying the code that's on that web server. And so SALT comes with a system in it called the pre rack <laughs> Um, which was actually designed uh, with uh, LinkedIn's assistance, but it's quite slick. So it allows you to define inside of your configuration management systems in SALT, um, which now I'm regretting that I'm not talking about more in detail. I, just, I like talking about them. But it allows you to define something that says, only run this routine if we expect something to be modified in the future, something specific. So you're able to define and say, go ahead and tell the load balancer to take me out of this system or shut down the web server only if I'm about to do a code deployment. And then once the code deployment is done, restore that previous state, which means that you can maintain um, very complex item potency concepts inside of, inside of a deployment, okay? It also means that they can fully automate that code deployment process in such a way that, again, completely minifies or, they hope, nullifies the possibility of continuous code deployment causing any hiccups in service and reliability, okay? Now, the last thing that I want to mention 
uh, with respect to LinkedIn's deployments is a concept inside of SALT called runners. Now one of the problems, one of the complaints that we get about SALT is that we have lots of terms for things. And we've had people come back and say, oh, well, you've got all these terms for things. And we reply and say, well, that's because we have lots of things that SALT can do. Now, you don't need to learn all the terms in SALT. You can be up and running, hardly knowing anything at all after reading two pages of documentation. You'll know how to start using SALT for remote execution and config management. Actually, I think that tutorial is like two and a half pages. It's not very big. But this next concept of runners is the idea where you're able to set up complex orchestration routines on a SALT master that can deploy systems in complex ways directly from code. So you write in Python a runner that is able to hook into the SALT system and say, all right, we're going to start by executing states the config management system in SALT on these servers. We're going to stop at certain phases. And many of these tools and features that allow you to control this from Python are built into the system. And then the runner is also able to aggregate data returns that are coming back from all of these minions, make, make decisions, and then fire events back off to this reactor system. So again, you're able to start making very intelligent automation routines if you need to. A very small subset of our users actually have to go this far. And it usually only ends up with very complex deployments. But um, the tools are there. A lot of the idea is that you don't need to deal with all of the tools in your toolbox. But if you just happen to be in a situation where you need them, we don't want that toolbox to be missing something critical. Okay, any questions, comments, laughter? My, my jokes are just, I don't have any today. I'm not doing very well there. Okay, now the last thing that I want to talk about, when do we start? It, we've got till uh, 540, so okay, 20 more minutes. The last thing that I want to talk about is starts to bring a lot of these concepts together. And this is where we start to talk about more autonomous computing systems. Now, I mentioned this reactor system. The reactor system in SALT is pretty straightforward. It listens to these events that are being fired. And if we have time, I'll show you what these events look like and show you a little bit more of the SALT command line. And then reacts to those events. It's fairly static. It's very two-dimensional in that regard. It gets an event and it does something with it. Now. One of the problems that we've, that we've been facing quite recently is that we got a company that wanted to do virtual machine auto scaling, but they wanted a level of flexibility that wasn't available in other tools. And so they came to us and asked if this was something which could be created. So we went out to some of our contacts who had been building um, autonomous submarines for the Navy because I knew that they were sitting on some Python code that, would, that to my happiness, will work very well with SALT. It's entirely event-driven. That they that had been licensed to be the, for them to open source. And so what's going on is that we now have and are bringing in an open sourcing. It's called IOFLOW, a logic engine that's used in robotics that is configured by very simple data structures. So you write some YAML, and it configures a robotics engine. The entire YAML needed for a submarine mission was generally less than 40 lines. So it's extremely terse and extremely um, direct. And it allows us to do all the levels of tree logic and, aggregate, uh, and, and uh, state aggregation that we need to to be able to make highly complex decisions about an infrastructure and then automate forward routines. So this new system is something that we're actively developing in response to this virtual machine auto scaling problem and in response to the ideas or concepts behind intelligent automation inside of a data center. And so what's going on here is that 
Now we are getting to the point where we can aggregate events across a tier so that it's very easy for us to get all of the events relative to the performance of, say, a web tier and a database tier and whatever else it is that's in your infrastructure, say your AMQP servers that are passing events around. Take that information back and it creates a state inside of this logic engine. And then when a certain state is reached, it fires an event off to the reactor to say, we're in a bad state of this type. Now the nice thing here is that it can start making extremely complicated decisions about what's going on in an infrastructure because we have underlying access to all of the components and a completely freeform logic engine. And so we're able to make decisions that say, all right, so the load is going up on our web tier. Great. If the load is going up on our web tier, then what we want to do is see what the disk I.O. load is on our web tier and on our databases so that we can determine if this is going up because of high I.O. weight or if this is going up because of too many connections and start to make much more informed decisions about what, what's going on. And then allow that logic engine to do things like say, well, given our current patterns, we're going to go ahead and start deploying virtual machines to the web tier, which are of a different shape and size. We are able to communicate back to the database to say we're going to expand this NoSQL database to be able to handle this higher load. Or we're going to be able to communicate that we want to build a failover RabbitMQ server that has higher load and then migrate the load over, or higher capacity, and migrate load over to it. And so these complex routines is primarily what we're working towards right now. Now, I just talked about all those. Now the simple solution today is to build that logic into a runner in Python that's going out and pinging the environment every couple of, every n seconds or minutes or whatever you want your window to be and then making decisions internally. But of course we want, it, we want something that's substantially more powerful and I'm really excited to say that the IOflow libraries that I'm talking about uh, we did get those open sourced earlier, uh, oh, it was last week. So those are up and available on GitHub now. They're, it's really cool stuff. Okay. So does anybody have any questions or should I dive into a little bit of a demonstration? Yes. Is it just um, more like a collective where you actively manage your environment? Okay, so, so the question was in Puppet, you can have configuration files that are replaced or updated from the master. Um, okay, so Salt is able to do all of, everything config management wise that any of the other guys can do. So yes, you can uh, maintain configuration on the Salt master and then communicate that configuration back out to the environment. So it really is like M Collective plus Puppet in its entirety together. Um, there's a number of there's a number of things worth worth pointing out when we start looking at Salt's configuration management systems. So I'm just going. I've only got some simple ones on here. I wasn't expecting to necessarily dive in here. But SALT's configuration management system is all based on YAML. Or rather, I should say, it's not based on YAML, it's based on data structures. And so all that matters is that we get data structures into the system. And so this is a very simple example where we're installing Apache. We're making sure that uh, the, the Apache package is being <coughs> installed. We're deploying a configuration file to the wrong location. I know I about this quickly. Um, what, what is it? At, at the httpd slash conf dot d slash httpd dot conf? 
I don't do it every day anymore. <laughs> uh, and then make sure that that service is running. So again, a very flat, simple example. Now, if you want to have uh, Turing logic and advanced variable scoping in there, you can use Jinja templating. Now, that means that you can do for loops in there. It means that you can do um, if-else statements. And it has full access directly while rendering these files into data to execute any of the routines on the command line inside of the remote execution system on the system that it's building on so that you can very easily shell out or run built-in routines, take that data back, and then munge it into your, into your system. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that one of the big dif differences with SALT is that you, might, you may have noticed that we've got these, re these statements like require and watch. Now this is a more puppet-like thing where we're ordering who's going to do what when and also what they're and building dependency chains. And so we're able to do this again very simply by saying that well this package is going to be required by the HTTPD service down here. The HTTP service is watching this file so if this file changes then you're going to restart or reload the service. Those sorts of constructs. They're all in there. Now the example I gave of reading into the future, are we about to deploy code and making a decision about something which is going to happen is another requisite called prereq. So we pre-require that something else is going to be modified. Now the next nice thing though is that um, in the absence of requisites, or rather, I mean with, with requisites in there, but it's a little crisper with the absence of requisites, everything in SALT is executed in the order in which it's defined, which means that these runs will always execute in the exact same order, and they will always execute in a highly predictable and understandable order because they're evaluated from top to bottom in these files. And similarly, it's really easy to tie all of these files together by just using that include statement up there where you come back and you say, well, I'm going to install, say, mod SSL. I'm going to include Apache. We're going to make sure that Apache now requires mod SSL when I'm using this, uh, this formula as well. And similarly, you can extend earlier scopes and systems so you can build hierarchical components. So all, of, all the components are there. I mean, without me blathering on about it for another 20 minutes or, well, another two days. <laughs> Yeah, all the components are there, and the goal, of course, being to make it simple, extremely predictable, high-performing, and entirely featureful. I'm sorry, that probably is far more than you are asking from your question, instead of me going, yeah, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Are you tired? Have I not been very entertaining? I don't have one question, but it's uh, it, the, the thing is that we have some software which requires some directive, directivity from the user whenever you need to, for example, you have a certificate in Apache, you need uh -huh. to password the certificate. Is there a way to circumvent this thing to use code doing that? Okay, so part of your setup process requires user intervention? Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, you've got a couple of options here. Um, one of them is that we've got quite a few SALT modules that specifically take care of those interactive types of scenarios. So we've got a lot of heavy wrappers around SSH routines. We have heavy wrappers around generating certificates and keys um, to make that easier. Uh, we also have a system inside of SALT uh, that makes it very easy to have a central key signing authority or certificate authority on the SALT master and have SALT generate keys, sign them, and securely distribute them for you. So I guess in a nutshell, uh, we've covered many cases, <laughs> uh, but we don't have, say, a generic way to work with continued standard input and output inside of commands in a YAML-like fashion. 
we have all those tools code-wise to make it very easy to build those routines built directly into salt. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Well, then I'm going to cover a couple of concepts really quickly since we've got a few minutes left and you're, you're not asking as many questions as I'm generally used to, which probably is my fault. I'm sorry. Okay. Now, inside of the salt system, I showed you... Whoop, Executing a simple command. Now this test.ping command, again, is just sending out a command that says ping to all of these systems, and all it does is return true. Very simple. But salt ships with a very substantial library, and is self-documenting. So we can run salt sys.doc. We'll pipe this guy over to less here. And now we can come through and take a look at all of these different routines and they all have examples on using them built directly into the remote execution system. And so let's see, we've had some ACL stuff, Apache archive routines, working with network bridges. Uh, there's more ways to shell out than you can shake a stick at. I'm trying to think if there's a Scottish phrase, a phrase I know for that, but I don't. Okay. Well, it keeps going. CP allows you to interface with Salt's file server directly instead of the fact that it does, it, does all that stuff automatically inside of the config management system. Which is another concept I should point out. Inside of SALT, everything is built in layers. Now this idea being that any component down the stack that you want to know how it works, or maybe you have a legitimate need where you need to interact with something lower on the stack of operations, everything is exposed. All of the routines that are executed by the configuration management systems inside of SALT are all exposed inside of the remote execution underneath the hood. So if you're wondering exactly how packages are installed, sorry, that's how files are managed through there. If you're wondering exactly how packages are installed, you can come down here and find the package module, which leads me into another point about how this system works. It does automatic normalization on every layer between distributions and what their underlying routines are. So if we come down here to package, There it is. All of these package routines are going to smartly know to use the routines from the underlying package manager on the system that they're targeting. So you can send a command down, it'll know to use yum or pacman if it's Arch Linux or apt-get or brew or chocolatey on Windows um, or anything. The other nice thing is that these commands not only execute on the right systems on the, on the target or with the right software on the target systems, but they normalize all the data return that comes back, which means that you can execute a single command to say, list all of the packages on all of my systems, and all of that package data is gonna come back in a, in a data structure which is completely predictable, okay? So that, again, it's the raw and important data gets <coughs> normalized. Now, looking at this one more time with data being uh, normalized and managed, if I do something like package.list packages, we'll see that almost instantly I go out and I gather that live package data about the target systems and it comes back in a data structure. Now, this is made to be printed as, in a very pretty way by default, 
but everything inside of salt is JSON serializable. The idea there being that, again, you can take all of this raw data and shove it into anything or shove raw data from anything into the salt workflow. This is something that comes up a lot, especially with these use cases I've been talking about, because we talk about integrating with Jenkins, it's really easy to send data out of salt and translate it into something that Jenkins knows because salt's always just gonna speak JSON, okay? But not only that, we can do this and tell it to output that information to the display in, in raw JSON or in any other format that we would like. So YAML, for instance. You know, we don't have one for XML because no one's ever wanted one. If someone does, it will be made. But it hasn't happened yet. And I make this joke every time, and still no one's made one just out of spite or something. All right. So the last thing that I want to mention in, um, in here and then we'll be all wrapped up. There's a concept inside of SALT called targeting. So one of the major problems we run into when managing an infrastructure is the question of who is doing what. It seems like a very simple and straightforward problem, but for those of you who have deployed, especially clouds now, because you're just spinning up virtual machines all over the place, you realize that that can turn into a bit of a problem. Now, many existing systems are fairly static in the way they make those determinations. They come back and they say, okay, we're going to go by host name. You're going to name everything according to a certain convention. Or they're going to say that we're going to store this who is what construct in some database somewhere. Now, SALT leaves it very open-ended for you to choose how to go about doing that. And so the way that that works is that I've been using just globs here to specify that we're going to be talking to everybody. But similarly, we can use, I know this is contrived. I'm not exactly a regex master. But we can use regular expressions instead of glob matches, which appears I may have found a bug in the development version of SALT. Or we can do something called grains. Grains are bits of static information about a system that gets generated when the system starts up. If you need information about a system that isn't static information, then you run an execution to gather that information because you need to execute a fresh routine to gather it, right? If it's static, we can store it in memory and we have extremely fast access to it. Salt is being built from the ground up to be high performing. But similarly, we can match systems based on these grains and we can statically set them. So we can have a grain and say, tell this minion that its role is a web server in its grains. And then we can say all of the systems with a grain of role equals web server are going to do these things, okay? And so you're able to do host name validation or information validation. Similarly, you can target systems based on their network information, um, or you can use uh, external databases to gather information about systems if you want to, or you can use what we call compound matching. So you can say, I wanna target all the systems that are running Debian, but not the 32-bit ones, uh, and only the ones that are in this subnet, um, but not the ones that are running on Lenny. And put all that together, and then it's going to just give you the ones that you want. So very, very fluid and open in the way in which things work. All right, I am out of time. And I'm, I, I'm sorry, usually I can get some chuckles out of people, but I must be like jet lagged or something. Uh, but yeah, I'm out of time. Does anybody have any questions before I let you go? 
Any comments? Any rotten fruit? Any rude Scottish remarks? Wow. Wow, I didn't get one. <laughs> yes? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and, and I mean, this stuff is all high level because, yeah, the reality is, is that, I mean, well, there's reasons why we have training classes. Things, there's a lot in there. Um, and a lot of this is, yeah, just to give an intro. But yeah, we can do that. Okay. Any other, sorry? Any other questions, comments, arguments, rebuttals? All right. I'll let you go then.